K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at sales at k98fm.com. Five, four, This is the Liz Harrison Show. Good afternoon, folks. I'm Liz Harrison. This is the Liz Harrison Show. Oh, excuse me. This awful cold weather, it is killing my voice. What can I do? (laughs) My goodness. We, uh, uh, well, it's Friday, January 9th. We have some good news out of France. Apparently, the terrorists that decided to shoot up the offices of Charlie Hebdo are dead. And reports are still coming in and things haven't exactly been confirmed yet. Although that seems to have been confirmed. There was another hostage incident there. Actually, two. One at a kosher market, the other at a print facility. The print facility is where the shooters that had been involved in the uh, magazine office shooting had gone. The kosher market were two of their friends, which means that hopefully this is over. Hopefully they didn't have more friends, but it seems the French have straightened it all out. Now, in other news that is relatively related to it, someone brought up on Facebook that Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, had come out saying things against terrorism. Yeah. Now, this was a statement at the first Hezbollah rally of the year. Kareem Shaheen, at K Shaheen on the Twitter, started tweeting out, Hassan Nasrallah addresses first Hezbollah rally of the year following tweet, I mean, because this is typical press. He he works for The Guardian, apparently, or at least just recently started working there. Hezbollah chief says, quote, inhuman monstrosity, terrorism more insulting to Prophet Muhammad than cartoons or films mocking him. I didn't stutter. Goes goes farther, folks. Hezbollah chief says extremists pose existential threat to Islam and message of the heavens. And Hezbollah chief says terrorism reaching states that exported extremists to region. Yeah, he's, he's blaming French, the French. Because they exported extremists to Syria. And, of course, the journalist points out, Why is everyone shocked? Hezbollah condemned Charlie Hebdo attack 
Fighting Sunni extremists is their public raison d'etre for helping Assad. So, if they're doing it at Charlie Hebdo, it is terrorism. If it's Hezbollah attacking Israelites, maybe it's not terrorism. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, and, and there are other political reasons why the leader of Hezbollah would come out this way. Yeah, big thing came out a couple days ago on the law blog over at Wall Street Journal. Palestinians to join International Criminal Court on April 1st. Uh, appropriate date, April Fool's Day. Just saying. I'm, I'm amused. I'm highly amused. Because if I don't laugh, I'll cry. We all know the reason why Hezbollah wants to be in the International Criminal Court. So, Wall Street Journal report, um, Joe Laria reports, quote, in a statement posted on a UN website, Mr. Bon, referring to the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, said he had received the signed treaty submitted by Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas on Tuesday night, formalizing his signature to join the world's war crimes tribunal. Mr. Bon is the official depositary of the treaty, and the document was reviewed by the UN's Office of Legal Affairs after the Palestinians submitted it Friday. Palestinians may file charges against Israel starting April 1, as the treaty stipulates a grace period after it is deposited with the UN chief. There was no immediate reaction from Israel. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu last week demanded the UN reject the request, arguing that Palestinians don't legally have a state, which is true. So, Mahmoud Abbas has gotten what he wanted, and it makes it so much better if they go and condemn terrorism. At least when somebody else is doing it. They're going to come up with a new term for what they do, by the way. and they're going to call what Israel does terrorism. Nobody should be surprised. And I'll be relatively unfair. This is Obama's fault. This is the fault of U.S. policy that is murky at best when it comes to how to deal with Islamic nations in general. I'm not referring just to terror organizations. And the Palestinian Authority is being illegally supported by our government because of, again, Barack Obama. Why? Because Hezbollah has been recognized as a terror organization for many years now. And Hezbollah is deeply involved in the Palestinian Authority. So therefore, by default, the Palestinian Authority should have been viewed as a terror organization because of its ties to Hezbollah. But now Hezbollah is going around condemning terrorism. Mm -hmm. Glass houses, folks, really. Well, it's terrorism when somebody else does it. It's not terrorism when Hezbollah does it. I, I'm waiting patiently. I want to see how they spin this. It, it shouldn't be very difficult because in spite of the relative uproar that has happened as a result of Charlie Hebdo, there is not much hope 
that we're going to see any real action. Especially now. I mean, this is one time when I wish that the French had not been so efficient in dealing with their issues. I, I hate to say that. I hate to imply that maybe it would have been better if they hadn't managed to track these people down right away or if they these people had managed to do more harm. You know, because it's filed under we are way too stupid. The whole idea of being tolerant of evil has gotten completely out of control. And the radicals honestly need to be worse than they already are. And in places where it actually matters, you know, because obviously we, we realize now that Syria and Iraq don't matter. It doesn't matter what they do there. It doesn't matter that we have women over there begging to be bombed because they'd rather be dead than deal with ISIS torturing them, raping them. That doesn't matter. Of course not. It's a blip on the radar. It's even under the radar of all of the lovely feminists that scream... Oppression of women. Yeah. Anyway. Onward and upward. And, and here's something that bothers me. I did not read through it all. But on USA Today, which I know people want to pick on them because of who they published before on this, There is an analysis uh, story under the college beat, campus beat. Dan Raymold did it this morning. Analysis, should student media publish Charlie Hebdo cartoons? Should they do it? I'm thinking, yes, they definitely should. But I don't know whether or not um, this gentleman, well, this gentleman is uh, hedging. He is a journalism professor, and he advises a student newspaper. And in summation... To a certain, well, basically, he offers a lot of questions as opposed to answers. And he prefaces it with the statement, to be clear, there is no right answer. And then he offers questions that individuals should, the editorial team should ask themselves at a student paper. Are the images essential to telling of the story? Well, if you're doing a story about people picking on artists picking on Muhammad, then yes, they probably are. How does their perceived sensationalism or their potential to anger and offend compare to their outright newsworthiness? This is a disingenuous question, just saying. Because arguably, the very fact that they are sensational pictures and do have the potential to anger and offend would be a reason why a student editorial staff would consider featuring them in the first place. That is the newsworthy statement. The fact that, in spite of Charlie Hebdo being attacked... There are still artists out there writing what caused the attack in the first place. Just saying. You know, this is, this is not necessarily a legitimate question. 
Are the images in any way illegal or unfairly hurtful to the people or groups depicted? Again, really, define unfairly hurtful. Really, we, we do need to go here. We're talking about people that went into a magazine office and shot it up because of the drawings being made in the first place, but let's back up some. Do we care? Is it ever unfairly hurtful to pick on a group of individuals that have failed repeatedly to grapple with the issue of extremism within their ranks? Do we really care if we are hurtful to anyone who follows a, what they call a religion, what is ar arguably an ideology, that has a body count that is perpetually increasing on a daily basis? Who cares about being unfairly hurtful to murderers? Seriously. And is it illegal? Maybe. In places where those people control everything and where they're doing the killing... Maybe. But does it matter? Let's try to remember. Why are we here? I mean, I remember the scene. It was relatively amusing from National Treasure the first time around. Nicholas Cage is standing there at the gala before he decides to go and steal the Declaration of Independence, before he actually carries out the act. He's already decided to do it at that point. And he's talking about the founders. They were arguably terrorists. Think about it. They engaged in destruction of property for the purpose of protest, Boston Tea Party. They committed violent acts against law enforcement, the British soldiers. Do we miss the whole statement about them tarring and feathering some of them? They engaged in civil disobedience and disobeyed the law. on a regular basis and they engaged in militant actions against the ruling body of this country at that time. But they're patriots. Hmm. Of course, you know, the militants that we're dealing with now probably do occasionally argue that, you know, we're no better than them. We started out just like they are. ISIS could say that, in theory. Of course, we weren't running around beheading people. Maybe there were some soldiers, the colonials, colonial mil militia. They, there may have been some who decided to take care of things the way their Indian brethren would do it, you know, scalping. But, hey. A different time, right? We're more civilized now, right? No. <laughs> no, in our own ways we sort of are, in other ways we're not. We've moved forward in some ways, but... 
obviously we're not capable of dealing with uprisings by individuals that are probably not righteous. No, I don't think that we need to be concerned with something being unfairly hurtful. Sorry, just saying. The next question. How will they play with your audience, specifically, a.k.a. student age readers and individuals on your campus or surrounding community? Well, this is important. Maybe. Maybe not. If it's an underground newspaper, then it's a different story. But basically, on college campuses, I'm going to tell you right now, because of these this question and the next question. It's a safe bet that none of these cartoons are ever going to see the light of day in print or online in a campus newspaper. It's not going to happen. Because basically, how will it play with the audience on a college campus? On a college campus, the liberal professors are teaching the students not to think. They are teaching them that they must tolerate any evil done in the name of religion as long as it's not Christianity or Judaism. They are not to speak out against Islam because that would be Islamophobia. You are afraid of them. You are a racist or something. No. Well, yeah, there, it's not likely that any student paper is going to carry any of these cartoons because of that first question there. The next question, what are your outlet's policies or accepted practices when dealing with the hot-button topics involved, in this case, religion? Uh, well, I just said it. No, you may not speak against Islam. Ask Brandeis University. They didn't want eye on her Ali. They don't want to hear anything that says anything about Islam being evil. Or subjugating women or promoting domestic violence. or supporting permanently maiming women in multiple ways. No. They, they don't do that. They don't really do that. Or if they do, it's, it, it's a cultural thing. And the women are consenting. Because, you know, consent is so important. No. No. Don't expect to see it in the college newspapers. Don't expect to see a meaningful conversation about this. Don't do it. It's ridiculous. And the bottom line is that, unfortunately, this is going to teach a very negative concept to budding journalists. The next, you thought this generation was bad. Wait, it's going to get worse. You're not going to get news that is meaningful anymore. You thought the mainstream media was bad. It's going to get worse because the people are going to be afraid to tell the truth. They will not investigate. They will not find out what is actually going on. They won't look into what I read from the very beginning. Why in the world would Hezbollah come out against that particular terrorist attack? That won't be a question that would be asked. And that's a really sad statement, by the way. Other questions that won't be asked. If 
our government continues to turn a blind eye to all of this and continues to allow individuals to cross the border without fear of being stopped or turned away. Are we honestly running the danger of what a lot of conservatives have said, that we are letting in terrorists? Have we already? Are they out there? Are they already out there? And not even necessarily the Islamic brand. We're talking also about letting just run-of-the-mill criminals cross the border. I mean, we saw the pictures. You know, the innocent children with the tattoos showing how many people they'd killed because of their involvement in drug cartels south of the border. You know, but they're just children. Our definition of children is totally different from what it is south of the border, by the way. My youngest is 13 years old. If I was not here and we were down there, there's a very good chance that he would already have committed several murders if he had been latched onto by a cartel. That's reality. But that's an innocent child crossing our border and trying to get a better life. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe they do want to get away from that life of killing and crime. But maybe they're being sent across the border by the people that control them in the cartel to get a stronger foothold for their business here in the U.S. And then we get back to our whole argument over why it might be a good idea to decriminalize or legalize all of the drugs. Mm Mm-hmm. At least you'd be getting, you know, tax income. Plus, you would be reducing the influence or desire of the cartels to get here and put children here. But hey, we're 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 dealing with ostriches in Washington. They have their heads in the sand. And who knows? See, the problem is that a lot of the time when it comes to Islam, going back to that of course, is people get locked into the idea that It's a particular race. It's not. It's all over the world. And while it would be unlikely for them to get a very strong foothold south of our border, it is possible. If only because of the criminal elements that already exist there. Yes, I did say it. Criminals would be more likely to get themselves involved in Islam in the area south of our border than anybody else. That's just the way it is. Because there are too many people that are involved in Islam that use criminal behaviors to forward their cause. And, you know, Criminals play with criminals, right? Something like that. Anyway, it is about time for a news break. When I get back, I am not going to talk about this. We do. I did promise that I was going to talk about domestic affairs and particularly things that will be coming up on the Hill. At least, that will be part of it. And some stupid things that came out of the mouth of Obama. Big surprise. But you should be amused. And it continuation on the issue of education. We'll be right back right after the news.
This is Vigilant Liberty Radio News from Independent Journal Review for January 9th. The Senate Energy Committee passed a bill today approving the Keystone XL pipeline. With a margin of 13 to 9, all Republicans on the committee and one Democrat, Virginia's Joe Manchin, voted for the measure. The pipeline would deliver oil from Alberta, Canada to refineries across the United States. The House will vote on its own version of the bill tomorrow, and once their version passes, it will go back to the Senate for debate. President Obama has vowed to veto the bill. Alaska Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski said the veto threat should not dissuade Republicans and chided the Obama administration for standing in the way. The Senate would need 67 votes to override any presidential veto, and there may be enough Democrats to reach that number. But House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi said Democrats would uphold any veto. California Senator Barbara Boxer is retiring after spending two decades in the Senate. In a video, Boxer says she is proud of her progressive record and that she is not going to retire because her work is too important. She simply will not seek re-election for the Senate in 2016. Boxer also said it's critical to keep the seat in progressive hands. California Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, California Attorney General Kamala Harris, and former L.A. Mayor Antonio Villagarosa are a few of the names Democrats are circling as possible replacements for Boxer. Former California GOP Chair Tom Del Belcario is also considering a run. President Obama is coming under fire for his recent trip to Phoenix, Arizona, after his motorcade twice drove past the Phoenix VA hospital that was at the center of the VA waiting list scandal. Veterans groups and Senator John McCain had asked the president to go and show support for the military by stopping at the VA hospital. But President Obama said in advance he had other things to do, including visit former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. The president also gave a speech on the economy at a local high school before leaving the state. And a woman in San Diego got the fright of her life when she tried to unclog the office toilet with a plunger. Instead of fixing the plumbing problem, Stephanie LaCasa found a snake. Terrified, LaCasa ran to get her office partner, and the two women taped the bathroom door shut before calling the San Diego Department of Animal Services. They retrieved the snake and identified it as a Colombian boa constrictor. Officials believe it is someone's pet and took it to a vet in hopes of finding its owner. This is Amy Curtis with your Vigilant Liberty Radio News from Independent Journal Review for January 9th. Hi, this is Jason Dibbler, co-host of Q with a View, heard every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on FTR Radio. Right now, FTR needs your help in making the jump into the 21st century through some long-needed equipment upgrades. This is where you, the great and loyal listeners of Great Conservative Talk Radio, can really lend a hand. Visit GoFundMe.com slash help upgrade FTR right now. Your assistance, no matter how small, will help to ensure that FTR can continue to offer some of the best conservative radio on the interwebs. Your donation of $50 gets you up to 60 seconds of airtime on FTR radio four times for a hundred dollars your ad will run 10 times or if you don't want to run an ad you can have 30 minutes of ftr airtime to talk about anything you want there are other thank yous for other levels of giving as well but those are some pretty great offers we hope you'll consider making a small donation to help keep quality conservative talk radio alive and thriving on the internet visit gofundme.com slash help upgrade ftr today thank you Hi, this is Steve Hamilton, Station Director at AltCon Radio. And that sultry voice you're listening to is Liz Harrison on The Liz Harrison Show. I did promise some domestic policy stuff, but first a little housekeeping. For those of you who are listening to the podcast, what have you, 
not listening live, you can go and catch the show in rebroadcast over on K98talk.com at 10 p.m. Eastern. At least that's the time for, that they are shooting for over there. Uh, now, it was mentioned in the news, the idea of the Keystone Pipeline. Now, first beyond what's going on on the Hill, uh, Nebraska court cleared an obstacle. So, there was a major obstacle involved in the Keystone XL. It, um, they, they rejected arguments from three anti-Keystone landowners, and the Nebraska justices upheld a 2012 state law that allowed Republican Governor Dave Heineman, rather than an independent commission, to approve Keystone's route inside the state. So, that has cleared the way, at least for the logistics of this. As for the political nature, Time Magazine, gotta love them. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, they're saying the pipeline is overrated by both sides. Now, I'm going to go and take a shot in the dark here. A couple years ago, at least, we had the uh, Dan Brown thing going on. Movies, etc. Angels and Demons. And the uh, A&E History Channel, one of those, went and debunked it. I was highly amused with it because they went through the entire movie and they debunked all of the things that were going on, like the lines on the map and all of the different things that Tom Hanks' character went through to go and figure out all of these things, the Illuminati, etc., etc., And they said it was all a pack of lies. Well, the movie said that. (laughs) So I was like, why did you bother? You you went through all of this analysis and digging in history and everything else. Meanwhile, the whole point of the movie itself was that it was a lie being used by a man who wanted to end up as Pope. And ended up catching himself on fire at the end. Because, you know, he got caught for killing the Pope. And, yeah. Anyway. I didn't understand why they bothered. And that's exactly what is happening here with Time Magazine. It would be much easier if it was as simple as they have made it out to be. Really. It would be. The Keystone XL issue. Well, obviously it is about moving oil and getting crude to refineries and all of that. Has become a political beast. Purely political beast. That's all. The environmental issues have been debunked for all intents and purposes. They want to argue about it, fine. Property rights issues have been thrown out the window by Nebraska. I'm not exactly pleased with the way it was managed, but that's the way it is. Nebraskans can deal with it. They have the means to do do so. That's their problem. If your state starts taking too much power, you deal with it appropriately. Unfortunately, it rarely happens that way, but the bottom line remains, that's their issue. So, what is the real issue with Keystone XL? Obama has turned it into an issue of himself. Hello, pen and phone. So, it's not about environmental impact, economic boom, or anything else like that. One way or the other, the oil in question is going to get to its destination. The pipeline is the safest way to do it. 
yes, there will be an, a temporary environmental impact when the pipeline is installed. Is it irreparable? No. Green things can still grow. As long as the pipeline is built properly and is maintained properly for its life, there should be minimal environmental issues involved with it. And as far as the political issue is concerned, the government has been waging war on fossil fuels. We all know this. The market cannot bear alternative energy as it stands right now. The government has been silly in the way that it has invested money in research and development of alternative energy sources, primarily using the are you friends with Obama equation as opposed to really looking at the true science. So if you really want to address the problem, we need to go and approach this in much the same way that, and I, I know a lot of people are going to be mad at me for saying this, but John Boehner, when he first went into Congress, he went after graft in the House itself. He and the Gang of Seven, as they were called back then. The check kiting. The inappropriate use of the post office, etc., etc., etc. So, that's what they need to do. They need to go into these programs that offer money, uh, government money, for research and development and say, enough is enough. No more, no more pork barrel that is based solely on who you know. And, and let's be fair, there are a lot of these things that get money that probably should have, no matter what. And if they did go by the merits as opposed to who the people knew, it would have happened. So I'm not talking about taking money away from things that actually might have succeeded. I mean, where's the money going to the alt fuel program that theoretically could keep the coal industry afloat? would negate the war on coal because the primary problem that this administration has with the use of coal is carbon emissions. And meanwhile, there's an algae that lives on it. And they have come up with a way to produce it, mass produce it. And lo and behold, the way is actually compatible with the industrial lands where coal burning occur occurs. Because nobody wants to be anywhere near it, so therefore, they have room. So they could be producing renewable oil from algae, biofuel, and no longer push carbon out into the atmosphere because it would be going back down through tubes or however they decide to do it. It would be going into those algae farms and creating oil that offers low emission fuel. <laughs> the only question is, you know, whether or not the auto industry or some industry that would make use of that oil would be able to retool various products that people would actually buy so that they could actually use that fuel, unlike what we had with the corn farm subsidies for that alternative fuel source. Mm -hmm. But hey, we, we don't do that. that. That would make sense. Oh, wait, no. The researchers involved in that probably aren't friends with Obama. Anyway, yeah. Keystone XL is a political beast. Newsmax reporting that Obama's veto is the key to the Democrat strategy for the GOP Congress. No right. The president is issuing veto threats now. Now, 
I, I love this because they sit there and say, well, he hasn't issued very many vetoes so far. Um, well, let's see why. Oh, I don't know. Maybe because Harry Reid was controlling the Senate, so therefore the president didn't end up with any bills on his desk that he didn't like. And, you know, the Keystone XL has 68% approval of U.S. citizens. 68%. So basically, the president decides to veto this. He is saying that 68% of Americans do not matter to him. It's the 32% that didn't show up at the polls. Or something. No, wait, it was much more than that. But you, you get the idea here, folks. He's siding with the 32% that are opposed. <laughs> that is not a president. That is a toddler throwing a temper tantrum in the White House. And if the Republicans fail to point that out and ram that message home, they're doing it wrong. This is when you wish that Andrew Breitbart was still around. But anyway, no, this, this, is, this is really priceless. You know, the people want something and he's going to veto it because he doesn't like it. Because it is a bill that he can't sign. I don't like this bill, so I'm not going to sign it. You're not doing what I want. Well, <laughs> he, he has been allowed to do whatever he wants for a while now, hasn't he? The question is, what's going to happen whenever the people finally figure out... He's only concerned with what he wants, not with what they want. Maybe Keystone XL will do it. I doubt it will. It's going to take more than that. And of course, we're heading into the State of the Union on the uh, 20th, I believe. So we have to have a, a new program for the president to promote. Because if we don't do that, then he has no purpose in this world. No purpose whatsoever. He has to give the people something. Throw them a bone. So what is it going to be this year? It is going to be free community college for all. Conversation, well, as uh, ABC News is putting it, conversation starter, definitely. Political possibility, not anytime soon. And thankfully so. We were talking about this last night to a certain extent on The Right War over on FTR and here on VLR. And you can go to VigilantLibertyRadio.us and catch that. But uh, what is this? <laughs> this is a joke, okay? And it is interconnected with other Obama atrocities. Community college is arguably the most affordable way for students to go to college. My own child is doing it. What are the rules in my house as far as this is concerned? She put herself in debt initially going to community college. This is something that people should not do unless they absolutely have to. There are certain programs within a community college system that have time limits to a certain extent. You have to finish the program within a certain period of time, and you may not be able to afford to be a full-time student, so you pull loans. That makes sense. So that you complete the program in a timely fashion, and you don't have to go back and retake courses because you took it the long way. But community college should be a situation where you pay as you go. Cash. Not loans. None of that, really. If you seriously can't afford it at all, you should be eligible for some sort of grant anyway because we've started to get grants involved in that. Now, I understand. The president wants to make people feel good and say that he actually cares about business and everything else. Why can't people afford community college? Could it possibly be because Obamacare has reduced the full-time hour from 40 
Yes, it has hurt the people that he has theoretically said that he cares the most about. They can't afford to go to community college because he's cut their hours by 10. There it is, folks, right there. So his solution, instead of agreeing that maybe that was a bad idea, giving everybody a 10-hour pay cut when it comes to entry-level jobs, because, you know, that's the other thing he's going to veto. He, he's not going to put up with Republicans or Democrats who realize that it really was just a 10-hour pay cut. 10 hours a week, people lose it because it doesn't make sense for companies to keep them anymore. Really? If they had those 10 hours, they could afford the community college. They wouldn't need the government to pay for it. And let's see. When we have a problem with increasing costs for college, the one form of college education that was affordable is going to end up with the government interfering so it will no longer be affordable anymore. Because you know that's going to be the end result. Because how else will any state that involves itself in this come up with budget shortfalls, come up with the money to cover the budget shortfalls? What are they going to do? Well, they're going to increase tuition on the kids that are paying cash. Because there's no free ride, people. There really isn't. There will be income and limitations and all that fun stuff. It won't be free for all in this program. So therefore, the ones who have families with a fair amount of money and they're trying to save a buck by going to call a community college before going to a four-year institution, which, by the way, is a whole other mess because of Democrats, uh, yeah, we're going to increase the cost there now, folks. Have a nice day. It's not going to save you anything anymore. Wow. Well, let's destroy the lifeline. That's, that's a great idea. Not. Anyway. And, you know, the whole problem why we're theoretically looking at this in the first place is because the radically increasing costs of four-year institutions. Why is that happening? Oh, I don't know. Maybe because you have institutional unions representing professors that keep on begging for more money, and these people really don't need it. Believe me, I know. Said it last night. These people do not get income just from colleges, because in order to survive in academia, you must publish. Which means that somebody is publishing your work, and if your work is being published, you're being paid! Yes. I mean, sure, there are some that are dealing with just journals, but a lot of them are taking their collected works and putting them into systems like McGraw-Hill. They are getting publishers to create textbooks. And I'll tell you right now, a textbook author out of McGraw-Hill is not, by any stretch of the imagination, poor. These are people that have... Fountains in their foyers. Believe me, I know, been told by a gentleman who actually worked for McGraw Hill as vice president there. Retired now. And by the way, yeah, he, he wasn't living poorly either. Of course, the authors made much more than him. Go figure. So, why are we in this situation? We need community colleges to remain affordable. We can't have the government interfering. The government needs to undo the damage it's done as far as colleges are concerned because as the price of education has gone up, instead of the government saying, enough, you need to stop, they have enabled them. They have increased the grants. They have increased the allowances for students to go into debt. And they are upset because now those students owe so much money to start out life. It's your own damn fault. You increased the amount of money that they were able to borrow because you didn't have the nerve to tell the institutions, you're not going to get federal money, your students will not get federal loans if you don't rein in your costs. This isn't difficult. Well, I, 
obviously it is, because when you have a system of government run by a bunch of Democrats, liberals, they're going to play nice with their friends in the ivory tower and make sure that they get pay raises and they're not going to give a damn about the students that will have to pay for it. No. They'll have their whole lives to pay back. Well, that's pretty much what it's going to take. What, what is it going to take, really? Liberals, think. Are you not going to be happy until it gets to the point where students are going to be paying for their school loans until they're 80? In other words, you're going to have defaults simply because the people die. Is that the solution? You want to make sure your friends are rich. Uh, it's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And here is hoping because, you know, this, the whole free quote-unquote community college idea has been noted as being expensive, quote-unquote. It hasn't been scored yet. Given what I think they want to do, I would say that it might make Obamacare look cheap. Yeah, that would be a good idea. We, we really do need another program that costs more money than Obamacare. Because we're not in debt at all. We can afford it. Not a darn thing on the books that we have to pay back. And, you know, there's, there's nothing else being given to the people. There hasn't been any increases in anything in years. There's no, no one going on welfare because of not being able to find a job and disappearing from the unemployment numbers, you know, because the economy is booming. We're creating thousands of jobs every day. It's just clicking along. We have no problems whatsoever. Okay. Oh, I want to end on something amusing. <laughs> Remember Scott Brown? I know, I'm going to have people yell at me for picking on this, but... Yeah, he, he was the former Massachusetts senator. Tried to become the uh, senator of New Hampshire. And now, because Barbara Boxer is stepping down... There is a parody account on the Twitter, at Scott Brown CA. <laughs> ah. One of the tweets that went out is, uh, quote, Just got back from the guy shredded on my new guitar. Now just reading about Senator Boxer's retirement. Interesting. Yeah. And then um, the bio for it reads, Proud to have long and strong ties to the Golden State. And then uh, another tweet is, um, I still think Massachusetts is harder to spell than California. And then another one, my friend wants me to ask if anyone knows a good mechanic in California. My friend is wicked into his truck and thinking about moving there. <laughs> really? Was this necessary? I understand the whole migratory pattern of politicians that want to remain in the fray, moving to where there's a vacancy. But one move is one thing. <laughs> Suggesting that it's just going to continue is something else entirely. Um, sorry, not sold until he actually, you know, moves west. Anyway, thank you very much, folks, for listening. Have a great weekend. I will be back here on Monday and hopefully have a better voice. This whole cold weather crap needs to stop. Have a good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>